Hello and welcome to the show. Tonight we're going to be talking to Peter Tatchell, the human rights campaigner. Uh, with me also is Zoe to ask the questions too. We've been getting lots of questions from you all day, so I don't think we're going to run out of questions to ask Peter tonight, to be honest. Um, where should we start? Oh, goodness me, there, there are a lot of them. I tell you, one of the things that fascinated me, and you actually did put this up on your website, so I hope it's okay that I'm going to read these, but it's some of the things that the papers have called you, which are quite extraordinary. Uh, a, a homosexual terrorist, public enemy number one, prize pervert, a fascist, pure poison, an enemy of the people. I mean, were you, have you been surprised at you know, how sort of venomous the media has been about you? Well, I think they all date back to about the mid-1990s at the height of the various outrage campaigns when we were very challenging and provocative in taking on homophobes in very you know, high-profile, powerful positions like bishops of the Church of England, even the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the then Prime Minister, John Major. You know, we tackled them all equally and without fear or favour. And, of course, we ruffled a lot of feathers. So I think a lot of their mates in the media... Uh, didn't like it, and they certainly turned their point pens to swords, and that's why you get those kind of comments. But it must still be, you know, when it first happened, it must be quite difficult to take that personally when you, you, you know, you're getting that sort of thing in the media. How did you, did you get used well, to it? Well, you were dishing it out at the time a bit. Um... <laughs> I wasn't dishing it out. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't vilifying or misrepresenting people. I mean, I think it's only really in the last few years that I've begun to get a fairly balanced, objective reportage about what I do. I mean, prior to that, a lot of it was just gross misrepresentation, you know. You know, in some cases, barefaced lies. I mean, the, the Times published a story about saying, Tatchell wants to be a martyr, he wants to go to prison. It was a complete fictitious mm. uh, story, uh, which one of their reporters of his own, you know, political ends decided to make up. Uh, he was a Tory, I was a left-wing socialist. He just saw it presumably as a convenient way to do me down. Um, but that doesn't happen anymore. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad and it's, it's a pleasure to have a more objective, balanced you know, reportage. Do, do you regret now some of the activities of outrage in that period? Not at all. I think we were absolutely right in doing what we did. And I think because we took on very big, powerful institutions and individuals, I think that did help change public perceptions a lot. Um, we were often vilified and demonised because of it, and that's a personal price that I've had to pay, you know, very greatly and quite dearly. I mean, I've, I've lived, you know, for two decades, you know, under constant death threats, hate mail, even physical assaults in the street, arson attacks on my home. But in the process of doing these campaigns, like exposing homophobia in sport, the hypocrisy of the Church of England, homophobic, hypocritical MPs, I think we did help change a lot of institutions. Some people will acknowledge it, others won't. I mean, there's a couple of the bishops we outed did actually say some years later that in hindsight it was one of the best things that happened to them in the sense that they were forced to confront their own double standards and, you know, basically we made it possible for them to come out. It, it wasn't of their choosing and they hated it at the time, but in retrospect they're glad that the burden of leading a secret double life has been lifted. And also, I think, within some of the MPs, um, a couple of the MPs said that they, they really felt that, you know, perhaps, you know, our challenging campaign, um, painful though it was for them, forced them to confront some of their own deep-seated prejudices. Well, I mean, to, to, his, to his credit, for example, Michael Patillo, you know, I absolutely did hound him uh, in the run-up to the Kensington by-election because of his role as Defence Secretary in witch-hunting gays and lesbians out of the armed forces, uh, despite his own admission of a previous homosexual past. Not only was he homophobic, but in my view, he was being hypocritical. But he said to me since that he feels that maybe what I did did actually force him to confront some of his own um, you know, prejudices and reflect on the way he had behaved. And in hindsight, he regrets you know, some of the homophobic positions he'd adopted and some of the homophobic measures he'd voted for um, earlier in his career. I mean, I accept your, your argument here about hypocrisy, but... Does even that give you the right to sort of make someone's private life public? Well, if a person in an influential, powerful position is abusing that power and influence to hurt and harm other gay people, and particularly if they themselves are gay, then I think that hypocrisy and double standard has to be exposed. I think if someone is preaching against homosexuality in public, but having secret furtive gay affairs, and voting against gay people, condemning gay people, 
then I think we can't tolerate that. So why didn't you expose Simon Hughes in the Bermondsey by-election? Because you knew, I mean, we ought, maybe we ought to explain a bit of background here, but you, you were the Labour, official Labour candidate in the mm. Bermondsey by-election in 1983. You wrote this absolutely excellent book about it, The Battle for Bermondsey. Um, and it, I mean, I don't know how you got through that, frankly, because I mean, you, you were probably subjected to the most terrible hateful campaign of any politician in the last 30 or 40 years in that by-election. Now you knew that the Liberal Democrats were behind a lot of it and you also knew that their candidate had well, either was gay, bisexual or whatever and yet you chose not to expose that hypocrisy. Mm. Why was that? I think I felt at the time I was not 100% certain then or indeed now that Simon Hughes himself was personally behind the homophobic campaign. Mm. Um, to this day, honestly, I do not know what Simon knew about and what he sanctioned. Yeah. So I felt really anxious and concerned about perhaps making a false assumption. And I also felt that on that occasion, in that circumstance, I didn't really want to resort to the Liberal Democrats' dirty tricks. Mm. I felt it was better to try and rise above it and just stick to the issues and, and fight a clean, honest campaign. Mm. And what, tell us a bit about that election campaign. I, mean, I know it's a long time ago, and we'll, mm. we'll come on to your, your current human rights work mm. in a moment, but um, it was the first time that you, you hit the national headlines, um, but it was a pretty it's a horrible experience. I think the words <laughs> baptism of fire <laughs> come to mind. <laughs> um, I mean, quite a lot of commentators say it was the dirtiest, most violent by-election in Britain for about 100 years yeah. since uh, Bradlaw or people like that. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was very, very, very scary. I was attacked, physically attacked, in that by-election campaign and the run-up to it over 150 times. I had more than 30 death threats. I had a bullet through the door, an arson attack, bricks and bottles through the windows. Uh, other people, you know, members of the public who displayed my election posters had their windows smashed. Mm. Like, I remember what... It really sticks in my mind. That's happened to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> an, an elderly man living in the constituency was a refugee from Nazi Germany. And he said he had never, ever experienced anything like it mm. since he fled the Weimar Republic, I think it was in 1934, 35. Mm. He said that the atmosphere of hatred and, and violence and menace you know, just brought back all those memories of, of, of the Nazi era. Now, obviously, it wasn't that bad. But in terms of British standards, it was pretty gross. Mm. And did you know you were going to lose? No. In fact, at the beginning of the campaign, um, in the, the three-week campaign in the beginning, um, the NOP poll actually still had me well ahead. But then, of course, they just began a relentless daily barrage of negative stories in the Sun, mm. the Mail, the Express, uh, Telegraph, you know, even the Mirror, supposedly Labour paper. And I think that's the, the constant cumulative collective effect was just to evaporate the support. Yeah. So that, that was nearly a, a quarter of a century, well, it sounds a long time ago, <laughs> a quarter of a century, <laughs> doesn't it? Like yeah. um, I mean, it's a, a very wide-ranging question, but I mean, that sort of campaign would never happen now, would it? I mean, that, obviously there is still homophobia out there, yeah. there's still homophobia in politics, but you can't imagine a candidate like you coming along and being subjected to that now. So I suppose things yeah. have, got, have moved forward a bit. I think so, yeah, I think well, that definitely. We had a few questions, actually, uh, about this um, that all came into your uh, blog, Ian. Um, Chris P. had said that he'd love to hear about the Bourbon Z campaign, which we'll be speaking about, and he said that one of your leaflets that came through is that they'd say, which queen are you voting for, and mm -hmm. it, uh, it seems extraordinary. Um, Can I tell a little story about that? Sure. At the time, at the time, the presumption was that this leaflet, 10,000 of these rather badly produced leaflets, the headline was, which queen will you vote for? And had a picture of Her Majesty and a picture of me. With my ca Her caption was, HM, the Queen. My caption was, Red P Gay Pete or something. But underneath, it sort of it listed all my supposed sins. I was a traitor, uh, anti-monarchist, blah, 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 left-wing firebrand. You know, if you don't like Red Pete, tell him what you think. This is his address. <laughs> and they gave my exact address. They gave my exact phone number. Now, at the time, we all assumed that it was the far right, because there were four neo-Nazi candidates standing against me, not just the National Front, but the um, um, English Democrats, or I don't know what they're called, but all the Lady Birdwood, 
um, all, all these loony far-right people. But it's since transpired, according to a member of the then Liberal Party, who was part of the election campaign, that that leaflet, he alleges, was actually cooked up by the Liberal Party with the approval of the most senior officials in their uh, election team. Well, that's one thing that hasn't changed in 25 years. They <laughs> still do that sort of thing now. <laughs> and, you know, you know, um, you know, no one's ever been investigated about that. Yeah. Um, and no one's ever been prosecuted. That, that leaflet was not, ha had no um, printed and published by it. It was a clear violation of election law being anonymous. And I suppose technically it invalidates the election result. Um, but I was really, really shocked that apparently the Liberals were behind this. Yeah. And you know, I, I really probed this person very carefully. You know, I said, are you sure you're not doing this to get back at someone? And he said, no, I've just got a guilty conscience. I was part of it. I've harboured this secret all, all these years. I just wanted to think, you, I think you, you deserve to know the truth. Well, New Mania um, wants, wants to know what you think about Simon Hughes now. Uh, and uh, Machiavelli said, do you think that Simon Hughes would make for a better Lib Dem leader than Sir Ming? <laughs> well, um, I think Simon has been a good constituency MP, no doubt about it. Obviously, I'm a Green, I'm not in the Lib Dems, not in Labour anymore. But um, I think he's been a good constituency MP. On most issues, he's, he's got a good, solid voting record. He's a Liberal Progressive Member of Parliament. Um, up until the moment when he you know, denied being gay or having had gay relationships, I was 100% behind him to succeed uh, Charles Kennedy. In fact, I backed him uh, in the election that saw Charles Kennedy become a Liberal leader. And I did that because, as I said, I thought he's... He was a good constituency MP, and he had a good voting record. So, you know, a lot of people are expecting me to hold bitterness and bad feelings towards him because of what happened in the past. But I think, you know, you can't go around holding grudges, and you have to move on. You've also got to, you know, judge people on what, where they are now, and not always by what they did, you know, many, many years ago. And I just think that, you know... Do you understand why he did, when he was asked the direct question in the leadership campaign, are you gay, and he said mm. no, do you understand why he did that? Um, not really. If he'd done it back, you know, in 1983 or 4 or 5 or even perhaps 1990, I, I might have understood it. Mm. But I think that really, you know, I, I guess it was a heat of the moment thing, he was just put on the spot and maybe he just panicked. Um, I doubt it was really premeditated, but I think he should have come clean immediately afterwards and said, you know, then, then, then the matter would have been, you yeah. know, people could have understood that. If, yeah. if, if just a couple of days later he said, look, I was caught off the hop on the heat of the moment, I was very panicked, I said the wrong thing, yes, I have had gay relationships, um, I'd ask people's forgiveness, I'm sure most people would have, you know, yeah. accepted that. But I think when he kept on trying to deny it, that's what really did him down. What, what was it like immediately after the by-election? I mean, the, the result was announced, you go home, it's all over. I mean, you must have been completely on the floor, almost unemployable as well, I guess, with all the publicity. Um, it, it was a pretty difficult period, but, I mean, I pretty soon afterwards took the... Well, yeah, I'd never had this burning ambition to be an MP. I mean, basically I got chosen as a Labour candidate because the retiring Labour MP, Bob Mellish, uh, went quicker than expected and suddenly we had to find a candidate. And because I'd been a good local secretary and organiser and helped boost the party membership and reconnect with local community groups, I was chosen. Um, my real sorrow, having lost, was not so much for me personally, although there was, a, there was a bit of that, but it was more that I felt I sort of, at least in part myself, personally yeah. let down the party, that Labour had lost a safe seat. But I, I decided that, you know, I, I could go away and crawl under a stone, but then I thought, well, hey, I've, I've established a public profile um, because of this campaign. How can I use it in a constructive, positive way? Instead of thinking defeat and misery and, you know, woe is me, let's just turn the negative into the positive. And so obviously the homophobic nature, the virulent homophobic nature of the campaign against me brought home the reservoirs that homophobia still existed in our society at that time. So I thought, well, let's try and turn this around and use it in a constructive way, use my profile, to challenge the obvious homophobia we saw in this election, which isn't confined to Birmingham, but is obviously all over the country in, in different mm. pockets. 
So that's why I put myself back into, you know, not exclusively, but, but principally gay human rights uh, campaigning for the next 20 years. I want to undo that prejudice, which had undone me, so that future candidates didn't have to go through what I went through. Mm. And so that lesbian and gay people around the country generally could have a, a safer, more secure, relaxed life. Well, City on Slicker um, wanted to know what is next <coughs> for gay rights campaigning? Because surely most of the key objectives that you've worked so hard for have been obtained. Now, at what point do you stop campaigning, or are there always going to be new infringements to be searched for? Well, I think it's a bit like racism, you know. We've got rid of all the key, you know, discriminations in race, um, but racism still exists. Um, you know, changing the law is one thing, changing the way institutions operate, changing public values or cultural values, changing attitudes is something altogether different. And I think it's quite true that the major areas of legal discrimination have, for the most part, been annulled. I mean, we still obviously have the ban on same-sex marriage. Um, we still have differential enforcement of the law, for example. You know, when the Muslim fundamentalist cleric, um, Faisal Abdullah, uh, whatever his name was, uh, incited the murder of Jews and Americans and others, he was immediately arrested, put on trial and jailed. But when another fundamentalist cleric, I think it was um, Abdul Muhid in East London, uh, encouraged the murder of gays and lesbians, nothing happened. He was allowed to do it. So that the law against incitement to violence and murder is often not enforced when the people concerned are targeting gays and lesbians. And we've got to ask ourselves, why is it when the Metropolitan Police and the Crown Prosecution Service claim to have a gay-sensitive, gay-friendly policy which does not tolerate homophobic hate crimes? You know, why isn't the law enforced when those eight Jamaican reggae singers put out records openly advocate kill advocating the killing of gays and lesbians? And why is it allowed that radio stations can play those songs, that record stores, even major record stores, and Amazon, for example, can sell those CDs? They wouldn't be allowed to sell CDs, quite rightly, uh, advocating the murder of Jews or black, black people. But, um, this is the classic conundrum, isn't it, about free speech, so wh where everyone agrees with the concept of free speech, but mm. some people would have the, the barrier there, some people would have it here. And we've seen that this week with the discussions over the sexual orientation bill mm. in, the, in the House of Lords, where I mean, 40 Conservatives... Um, supposedly under David Cameron becoming much more gay friendly. They voted um, against it and I think only five voted in favour. You've got an example there of a Liberal Democrat MP who um, has basically questioned the validity of it. So, I mean, you're right, there is some way to go, but how do you judge where to draw the line? Well, I think free speech is so precious and its limitation has so many dangers that we have to have very compelling reasons to infringe free expression. And where I draw the line is incitements to violence. That, for me, is the red line where we say, no, this is a step too far. You know, we haven't mounted a campaign against the reggae singers who are merely homophobic. It's just been against those mm. that have openly advocated killing gays and lesbians. Um, you know, I don't think those who advocate homophobia should be let off the hook but they should be challenged, criticised, you know, their attitudes exposed, not criminalised. Well, what do you say to people who um, have fundamental Christian beliefs that homosexuality is a sin, and if they run a guest house, they should be allowed, if it's a private residence, they should be allowed to choose exactly who they have staying in their guest house? Well, I think when you set yourself up as a commercial enterprise and you're open to the public, then you have to be open to the public. Um, I don't think we'd tolerate bed and breakfast owners putting out signs, no Jews, no blacks. No, quite. Um, so why should they be allowed to put out signs well, saying no gays? I, well, I agree with you, but I, I had this argument the other day with, uh, on one of our programmes on 18 Doughty Street with uh, my colleague Donald Blaney, who was saying that he thinks that you should be allowed to put whatever sign you like outside your building on the premise that if you did that, no one would actually want to stay with you anyway, mm. so you'd fail, and a mm. good job too. Mm. Which is an interesting argument. I mean, I don't think it, I, I don't agree with it because I don't think that you should be allowed to discriminate in that way. But I mean, it, it is a valid point of view. Mm. Well, I suppose you could say that the market, in that sense, w w w w would, would penalise those who adopt the prejudiced mm. stance. I just think that it's very important that the law sends a signal 
And if we want to have an inclusive society where everyone feels a part of it, where everybody is respected and valued, then we can't allow maverick people, even if they are a tiny minority, mm. to go around openly advertising hatreds and prejudices against anyone for any reason. Well, these are the comments that, that Danny Alexander uh, had made. He's a Lib Dem um, MP. He, yeah. He'd said that um, it seems that some limited exemptions to the regulations are appropriate to make, that, make sure that correctly extending the rights of one group does not unacceptably curtail the freedom of another. Saying, um, so he's saying that he'd like to see some religious exemptions in relation to churches. These should cover buildings whose function is as a place of worship and to uh, specific doctrinal activities of that religion. This would prevent a church or other building of worship from being forced to hire itself out to a group that it believed would contradict the doctrines of its faith. This seems to me to be a fair way to tackle the unacceptable discrimination that is seen far too often whilst ensuring the freedom of religious groups to practice their faith is also protected. So basically he's saying that, you know, if it goes against the church's religion, that, you know, they're not, um, they don't agree with homosexuality, that they wouldn't have to, say, rent the hall out to a, a Why, why a should it be different for churches? Well, because he... So he, not quizzing he, he, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I guess what he's saying is, is it, it's a, um, stopping the freedom of the church, the freedom of the church to, to, well, to turn away. Well, I, I agree it's a difficult ethical mm. dilemma. And I think we have to go on balance of what is best if not perfect. And I think that the basic principle has got to be that we need to establish a legal framework which says that everyone in our society is entitled to equal treatment, that everyone is protected against discrimination. And once you start giving exemptions, where do you stop? Should a Christian you know, church hall be allowed to refuse a Muslim or Jewish youth group? Well, they don't allow yoga at the moment in church yeah. halls, which I always... Gets, you know, well, some, some church halls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, yeah. um, I think it's, it's, it's a really, it is a difficult area. It's, it's not, isn't clear cut. I absolutely agree. But I think at the end of the day, you know, apart from a limited number of, as you say, doctrinal opt outs, for example, under the new regulations and the preceding employment protection laws, which protect lesbians and gays, there is no requirement for a uh, church. Uh, to ordain a gay person uh, or to employ a person where it is a matter of faith and goes against the faith. But it would and is wrong uh, to deny a job to a person working as a caretaker for a church hall because obviously their caretaking role, um, even if they are gay, has got nothing to do with the fulfilment of a religious mm -hmm. duty. You said, um, just going back a little bit, that... The, you don't feel that the attitudes have completely changed sort of within society, although you know, legally it's changed, mm. perhaps people's views haven't. I mean, how do you actually go about then, you know, changing people's uh, opinion? Well, for example, a lot of the... You know, I'm involved with Outrage, the direct action group. Um, we're the radical wing, if you like, of, of the gay rights movement. Provisional wing. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> I, I won't accept that word, but anyway. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Um, the other mainstream group is, or the, the, or the mainstream group, is Stonewall. And their role is very much around law reform and parliamentary lobbying. Not entirely, not exclusively. They're doing more on education and so on, employment uh, practices and so on. But they've been, up to recently, been very much focused on changing the law. And Outrage has always taken the view that changing the law is important, but not sufficient. We also have to change cultural values and attitudes. So therefore we've done a lot of work around the church, mosques, synagogues, temples, what to challenge you, religious opinion. I mean, I, I, I've seen pictures of you invading the um, Canterbury Cathedral. What, what, other, what else have you done? I just have this picture of you invading a mosque. Have you done that? Have you done that? <laughs> we haven't invaded a mosque, no. But, so but we great have bravery. In, <laughs> in we, we, we have uh, leafleted plenty of, um, shall we say, Islamic fundamentalist um, meetings and groups. And what reaction do you get? Um, extremely aggressive and hostile and... Um, which has only served to highlight our concerns. You know, I remember when we did a very entirely peaceful picket. You know, it was, it was 1994, this is the best example. In 1994, Hizbut Tahir, the Islamic fundamentalist group, who have now disguised their fundamentalism um, very carefully because they never realize it's bad for PR. But then they were much more open that, you know, women who have sex outside marriage should be killed. Yeah. Gays and lesbians should be killed. You know, Jews and apostates should be killed. This is the language they were using only in 1994. Um, you know, they had a mass rally, indoor rally at Wembley Arena in 1994, 
tender by 6,000 of them. We could only get five brave members of Outrage willing to go to challenge them. But we did. We went outside and we simply you know, condemned their homophobia and their misogyny. Uh, we didn't call for them to be killed. We didn't threaten them. We didn't menace them. Um, but we, we were th explicitly threatened with being killed right in front of police officers who did nothing. Who did nothing. They allowed these fundamentalists to openly threaten to kill us and did nothing. In fact, we were eventually arrested for obstructing the highway and allegedly for, for behaviour like the cause of breach of the peace. Um, so it's, it's something we have taken on um, and I think it's, 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 it's pretty important because not all Muslim people are homophobic, but there is a strand of extreme mm. conservatism spilling over into fundamentalism that does indeed adopt a very homophobic stance and which does believe that gay people deserve to die. And that, of course, doesn't really so much impact on you know, a white gay man like me, but it has a devastating impact on Muslim lesbians yeah. and gays who are subjected to incredible family and community pressures, which result in very high rates of suicide, attempted suicide, which in some cases result in honour killings or attempted honour killings, even in this country. I know of five cases of attempted honour killings in Britain in the last ten years or so. These are ones I know about, and it's very hard to get information, but these are ones I know about, where Muslim families appear to have organised the murder of their own sons and daughters because they thought that being lesbian or gay brought shame to them, their family and their religion. Moving back over towards politics for, for a bit, um, we had a question from Joseph and he said, I understand that your current party is the Green Party uh, and he'd like to ask you if you think they have much of a future since green issues are no longer marginal and that the, all the main parties are now fighting to go green. I think the thing is that the Green Party is much more than just an environmental party. It's a whole political philosophy. And I think what really distinguishes the Green Party from the other three main parties is that it doesn't accept the consumerist, you know, materialist sort of world view. It's trying to step back and say, look, spending more, making more, earning more is not the be-all and end-all. It's quality of life. It's good friends, good communities, a good society that makes life fulfilling and uh, worth living. Now, I suppose that must be a philosophy that you have to sort of live by. Because I would say, being you know, an activist, I can't imagine that that gets you a great income. <laughs> I mean, how, when you're spending all your time fighting for causes, how do you make that, you know, how do you manage to make a living from doing that? Well, if I may say so, I, I, I've worked <laughs> for 40 years for human rights. The first campaign was against the death penalty. The second one was against the draft and uh, the war in Vietnam in my native Australia. The third one was uh, for Aboriginal land rights, also in my homeland. Um, but in all those 40 years, I've never been paid a penny. I've never been the director or chief executive of anything. That's not the way I think, not the way I operate. I just believe in issues and I work on them and campaign for them. But I make about, I don't know, eight, seven, eight, nine thousand pounds a year from bits of research, journalism and things like that. But, you know, is that not, how does that sustain you living in London today? I mean, that must be... <laughs> it must be pretty tough going, on. It is. It isn't easy. Um, a very well-worn bicycle. I have a very well-worn <laughs> bicycle, this is true. Um, yeah, I would like to live a bit more comfortably, um, but I don't want, you know, you know, the idea of aggrandising huge material wealth is, doesn't interest me at all. Um, it would be nice to have a bigger flat, perhaps in a safer area, um, you know, a bigger flat just because my, my, my flat doubles as an office and sort of like <laughs> the living room ain't really a living room. It's like just piled with papers and files and everything and I'm, I'm a minimalist at heart. People come to my flat and there's they, they, just clutter and piles everywhere. Not by choice, but just mm -hmm. I haven't got any more yeah, space right. to put anywhere. Uh, well, Paul Linford has um, brought up, of course, about uh, your... Well, how should we put it, your, your meetings with uh, Robert Mugabe, because I believe it's twice that uh, you actually tried to make a citizen's arrest. Um, and he would like to ask you um, whether you now wish that instead of uh, beating about the bush and arresting him, that you'd simply assassinated him. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, this is, this is a, a difficult moral ethical issue, isn't it? Um, a simple no. No, no, I don't think it is quite as simple as no. Um, 
I was once asked in a, one of those little Vox Pop things, the New States for many years ago, where would you like to be, back in history, where would you like to be, when, where and why? And I think I said the 20th of January, 1933, in the garden outside uh, Ribbentrop's house in Berlin to await the arrival of Adolf Hitler. And he could have very easily been assassinated. Mm -hmm. And I think in those circumstances, assassinating Adolf Hitler would have been justified because then he wouldn't have become Chancellor. Indeed, the Nazi Party would have been thrown into a big power struggle. It might have devoured itself. Who knows what may or may not have happened, but it could have changed the course of history. So I think in that circumstance, perhaps with hindsight, I agree, I think you know, assassination can be justified. With regard to Mugabe, um, you know, may, may be, since all the avenues for peaceful democratic change have been closed, then perhaps there may be a moral ethical case. Well, but I don't think it should probably be a white British person. I think it should probably be a black Zimbabwean. It's a very dangerous path you're going down, though, with that line of argument. I mean, in, in essence, I mean, you're licensing assassination all over the world. Because, I mean, there, there are lot, it's not just Mugabe. I mean, there are lots of evil dictators that we mm. would all like to see the back of. Mm. Um, but are you seriously saying that, that, that you, you think that's a legitimate thing to do? I, I, I'm saying that I can see an ethical case that when the avenues for democratic peaceful change are closed, when there isn't an option, just like we had to go to war against Nazism because the possibility of peaceful resolution was not on the cards, so maybe in certain circumstances assassination may be justified. Of course, preferable, I think, would be to establish a proper regime of international law whereby human rights abusers were arrested and brought to trial. So, using that logic then, you would support the Americans uh, invading Iraq and getting rid of Saddam Hussein? No. Because well, well, I mean, he killed hundreds of thousands. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many people Mugabe has killed, but I mm. suspect it's not hundreds of thousands. Yeah. I mean, that was genocide. Surely mm. Saddam Hussein was a far more serious abuser of human rights than even Mugabe. Yes, and that's why for many years prior to even the First Gold War, I was involved in supporting the democratic and left-wing opposition inside Iraq who were fighting against his regime. I remember many, many lonely small protests to the Iraqi embassy in the 80s, you know, when Mr. Bush and Mr. Blair <coughs> had no concern for the human rights and sufferings of the people of Iraq, but, you know, a few hundred people in this country, some of them Iraqi exiles, some of them British citizens, took a stand to try and support the struggle for freedom in Iraq against Saddam Hussein. I think the way to deal with Saddam Hussein would have been to a long, long time ago start supporting those forces within Iraq who were struggling to overthrow him. I think in an Which authentic... Which they did do in the 1990s, but it never really got anywhere. It was very, a very half-hearted effort. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, um, there were and are some very, very brave people in Iraq who are standing up for democratic humanitarian values, even today as we speak, and they're not getting much support. But, I mean, there is now a pseudo-democracy in Iraq, at, at, at the very least. It, it was that their legal system that sentenced Saddam Hussein to death. Mm. Did, he, did he not deserve that? Forget the circumstances mm -hmm. of the actual hanging, but w was that not the right thing to do? I think that democracies, or countries aspiring to, to be democracies, have to live by a higher moral ethical standard. I think descending to the methods of the dictator you've deposed diminishes and tarnishes the society. But you just kind of did that by saying that you could see the case for assassination. Well, yes, but, you know, when he's captured, when, he, when, he's, when, when, when Saddam Hussein was captured, put on trial and found guilty, I think the appropriate sentence would have been life imprisonment. Uh, and probably life imprisonment in a, a place like The Hague, outside of Iraq, so there could be no hope of him being sprung mm. Uh, and released, and I frankly um, would have put him in a cell, plastered floors, walls and ceiling with photos of his victims, so that every day he would have to wake up and see the faces of the people, or some of the people he'd killed, and I would pipe into his cell every, you know, several hours each day, testimonies from the victims. And then, if there came a point where he began to show remorse, then I think he should be given normal privileges. 
Well, I agree wholeheartedly with that, but wouldn't, so, so, wouldn't the, you the, be... the, the better thing is to have Saddam alive, you know, expressing remorse, and at least, you know, expressing a desire to have a free and democratic Iraq. But of course you'll get some human rights lawyer saying you're abusing his human rights for doing that. Well, I think, you know, <laughs> making him look at the photos of his victims... I don't think that's an abuse well, of human no, rights. You, you, could, you could legitimately argue that if you, I mean, if you take that example, decorating his cell with his victims, piping in the sounds of them, some people would regard that as a form of torture. Uh, well, I think they'd be mistaken. Mm. And I, I think that, that, that would be entirely justifiable. What that swift execution did was two things. First of all, deny a proper trial for all his far more serious crimes, yeah. where, of course... Western nations were implicated in because we, you know, helped support that and it gave him, gave him sort of the nod and the wink and in some cases weapons and so on. Well, um, we, we but gave him the nod and the wink to kill hundreds of thousands of Kurds. Um, no, but, but certainly the, 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 the war crimes committed against the people of Iran, um, that, that, that's, we mm. were certainly, you know, guilty of, of, of collusion with that, you know, the, the use of all those horrendous weapons, um, some of which appear to have originated at least in part, in the West. Um, the other thing, of course, is, is that we, we denied any opportunity for him to, um, you know, face up to and acknowledge his crimes. And I'm, you know, I'm a great believer, as the Simon Hughes example shows, I'm a great believer in redemption. I'm an atheist, but I believe in the principle of redemption, you know, that, that even bad people can redeem themselves. And that, that, that must be the goal. I'm not one of these hang em and flog em, the vengeful type. That's not me. Uh, I was wondering where you were going with this analogy between Saddam Hussein and Simon <laughs> Hughes. Um, that, we, we started on Zimbabwe but got sidetracked. How did you first become interested in the Mugabe regime? Well, of course, I was involved in the campaigns in the 70s to support the Zimbabwe freedom struggle against the white minority regime of Ian Smith. And indeed, you know... No, you wish you hadn't been. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, Ian Smith was, uh, was, was bad news, and I'm glad he's gone. And, um, although, but, I must admit, his abuses, and they were abuses, pale into insignificance mm. by comparison to what Mugabe has consequently done. But anyway, you know, I supported that struggle. It was a just struggle. And again, I didn't like the idea of supporting a war, because, you know, the Zimbabwe African National Union and the Zimbabwe African People's Union both fought a very bloody guerrilla war, uh, and lots of people died. And, you know, I felt very morally ambiguous about that, because suffering was involved. But on the other hand, the avenues for peaceful democratic change were closed. You know, it just wasn't possible to secure change through the ballot box. So I think in those circumstances, the people of Zimbabwe really had no option. But then, of course, um, unlike some people on the left who took their eyes off Zimbabwe once, you know, a black leader was in power, I continued to follow things and began to soon on realise that um, within a few years Mugabe was resorting to some rather authoritarian and rather brutal me methods to strengthen his own personal power and the power of his party against that of rival leaders like Joshua Nakomo and his movement Zapu. And then of course heard about these terrible massacres in Matabililand, the region of Zimbabwe which was you know, not entirely, but had strong voting support for Joshua Nakoma. Um, and, you know, hearing these, these terrible tales of massacres, I, I realised something was going very badly wrong. And it wasn't really until the, the early 90s that I began to sort of doing campaign work on it. And then sort of around the middle, just before the mid-90s, human rights activists in Zimbabwe approached me and said, you know, you know we know you've been involved in the supporting Zimbabwean people for a long time. Um, you know, we need help now. You know, the world is not listening, the world is not watching, the world doesn't realise mm. what's happening in our country, what this man is doing. And, you know, um, so I really responded to their request and, you know, we, I organised some protests outside the Zimbabwe High Commission and, you know, they were sort of, you know, quite noisy and effervescent but really didn't make an impact. So I thought, obviously, we've got to do something a bit more dramatic. So I hit on the idea of using international law as a way of bringing him to justice using the power of a private citizen to make an arrest of someone who is, where there's evidence they've committed a crime or authorised a crime or condoned a crime. I um, thought about using the Torture Convention, which has a universal jurisdiction, and getting him arrested for torture. And I got 
cases from Amnesty International of two black journalists in Zimbabwe who had been tortured, um, and the evidence very strongly pointed to Mugabe's direct authorization of their torture. Indeed, when questioned about their torture, he just dismissively, he, didn't, he was asked to condemn it, he refused, and sim simply said they, they got what they deserved, they were lucky they didn't get much worse. So this was a very strong prima facie case. And of course the first attempt was here in London. Uh, when he was on a private visit, we ambushed his motorcade and forced it to halt. I opened the car door, grabbed him by the arm, said, Mag President Mugabe, you're under arrest on charges of torture. Torture is a crime under international law. And you should have seen the look on his face. I mean, he's just like, he's not a very big man, he's quite a slight man. He just slumped back in his seat, looked like a little tiny boy. You know, an ashen pallor went over his black face. His, his, his eyes popped, his mouth dropped. I think he thought he was going to be killed. But, but I, I didn't did make sure. I grabbed him with this hand. I grabbed his arm with his hand and put this hand out like this to make it clear I didn't have a weapon. And the, the, interestingly, the bodyguard in the in back seat next to him just froze. And it was just totally hopeless, useless. <laughs> I thought he was going to pull a gun. I was ready to jump to the floor. But, but you know... Just take me through. When, when you plan these stunts, mm -hmm. because, I mean, you've done quite a few high-profile things, and... I mean, whatever one thinks about whether you should do, do this sort of thing or not, the thing that fascinates me is the thought process that you go through in the few minutes leading up to it. Mm -hmm. what, what goes through your mind? Do you think to yourself, what am I doing? Or are you so concentrated on what you've planned to do? I think with five minutes to go, <laughs> you, don't, you don't question what you're doing. You know, you know what you're doing and why. The panic is, will you get rumbled? Yeah. Like, um... Because it's a bit like, I mean, I, I'm not going to call you a terrorist, but I was watching the United 93 film the other mm -hmm. day, and they, they had the three terrorists who took over the plane, mm -hmm. and it, it was done sort of like in real time, and there, there was no sort of real acting in it. It was done almost as a documentary. And you could see these three people, um, particularly one of them, wrestling with what they were about to do and were they actually really going to be able to go through with it. And I imagine with the kind of stunts you, you do, it's a similar thought process. Can I actually go through with this? Mm. Well, it's not can I go through with it, will I be able to go through with it? Have I mean, at the time when I ambushed Blair's motorcade in Piccadilly just before the invasion of Iraq, I mean, the whole area was crawling with police. There were, you yeah. know, Sharpshooters and all the, this was around when he was meeting Gerhard Schroeder at the Royal Academy. Yeah. There were sharpshooters and all the building tops. You know, there were dozens of police either lining or walking up and down the street. So I hid in a shop, and sort of in the back of a shop, with an eye line looking up uh, Piccadilly towards Green Park, because that's where I assumed his motorcade would come from. And my timing was, you know, I hid behind all these scarves and everything so that police looking into the shop didn't see me, because I knew they'd, they'd recognise me. I just said, do you think they're all there now? They've all got a photo of you going, yeah. watch out I don't out think they need man. a photo. <laughs> well, but, if I go near Parliament sometimes, I'll get stopped, because they'll assume I must be going there to do something. You know. Anyway, um, so I just waited until I first saw the first motorcycle outriders come past, and then I just calculated the first car would be um, um, the police uh, special branch, uh, security people, and the second car would either be Gerhard Schroeder or Blair. So I just assumed it was going to be Blair. I assumed that Schroeder had gone in through his own motorcade. A bit of a gamble. So I just when I saw that, I just walked out, out the door, straight across the road, and just timed it perfect to walk in front of his motorcade. And it screeched to a halt literally six inches from my legs. I pulled out my... I, mean, I could have had an Uzi machine gun, but I pulled out a placard, you know, against the invasion of Iraq. Um, and what was really interesting is the car in front with the, you know, the special branch you know, bodyguards and everything, it kept on driving, not realising really? what had happened. And the other special branch behind, they couldn't see what was happening because obviously Blair's car was in front. So I was there for 45 seconds, which sounds very short, but it's an incredibly long period of time in that yeah. circumstance. And, and then 45 seconds before they managed to get out and, and start grabbing me, and then I hang on, hung on to the underside of his car, and so that took me took him another minute or two to get me out from under there. Um, well, so you said you, that you're grabbing for your placard. You could just imagine all the sharpshooters, you know, has he got a gun? <laughs> no, it's Peter Tash. Just <laughs> let him, <laughs> exactly. Let him go. Have you ever bottled out of one of these stunts? No. Oh, we did make, um, we did revise the plans. Um, two days after the House of Commons voted to maintain a discriminatory age of consent in 1994. 
um, we got a tip off that John Major was going to open the new casualty unit. Was it casualty unit or emergency? So, some new unit at King's College Hospital uh, in Camberwell. So we decided we'd ambush him uh, inside the hospital. And you know, we had all, this, all, all these operations are planned military style. Everything, everyone mm -hmm. delegated a task, division of labor. There's a plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, you know, exactly, we've got plans of everything so we know exactly where to go. Um, it is like planning a terrorist attack. <laughs> <laughs> if any you terrorist know that, group, do you? Well, no, no, no. If any terrorist group ever want to do anything, they ought to hire you. That's the way you well, bump no, your no. income up. <laughs> Mr. Blair and his, his Prime Ministerial Security Unit should hire me <laughs> to point out the flaws and facts. That day, if I'd had a gun, I could have assassinated Blair. Yeah. Because I'm not going to discuss it now, but there was a weakness and a vulnerability in the armour plating of his vehicle. And that 45 seconds had get, give, get, gave me enough, in theory, enough time to have pulled out a, a high-powered weapon and to have shot him. Mm. Um, but anyway, that, that, that aside, um, I am a Gandhian. Uh, I believe in the principles of nonviolence, except in the <laughs> cases of Nazism. Or Too bloody good <laughs> job. So <laughs> <laughs> preaching the opposite, anyway. Um, um, so, so the long and the short is that, um, you, know, you know, on that occasion with, with John Major going to the hospital... Unfortunately, they changed his, 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 his uh, plans uh, at the last minute. And this may have been deliberate because it was at the height of the IRA terrorist camp, mm. or, the, or the IRA terrorist campaign was still going on. So they changed plans and shut off certain areas that early in the morning and we did a rec reconnoiter and they'd been open. Um, and so we decided we would ambush him as he came into the courtyard. But then we checked out and there were sharpshooters on all the roofs and we thought the risk of being mistaken for IRA people was yeah. po possibly too great so we didn't do it. What we did do was waited until he left and we, we um, of course the whole area was just crawling with police and sharpshooters and you know, binoculars everywhere but we, we waited down Denmark Hill at a bus stop um, reading newspapers and there were police cars and police people walk, police women and women walking apart to check out and we, we was, Chewing at the bus stop, reading our newspapers. And then when his limousine came down the street, we just ran out straight in front. Uh, held up placards, you know, equality at 16. Mm. Um, forcing his car to swerve and veer into the oncoming lane of traffic. It almost hit a bollard. I mean, they should have stopped or, or slowed down. They, but they kept on, they slowed down a bit, but just veered across the road and then went around us. Mm. Um, but the... <laughs> The funniest thing about it was there obviously is some anti-terrorist mode um, because as soon as this happened, they must have, as soon as they, we, we jumped out, they must have shouted terrorist alert or something and Major went down like this in his car. <laughs> That's all right. And uh, so we were very cheekily afterwards, put out the news release uh, for the first time ever. We got John Major to bend over for gay men. And moving swiftly on. Saucy, <laughs> saucy and sleazy, I know, but we couldn't resist yeah, it. Well. Um, do you think, though, in, in the past, that some of the things you said were, were they sort of deliberately outrageous to get the attention? Or were they things you believed in? I'm thinking of when you were saying about um, that, that gay men should be allowed to, to have sex out in parks and, and, and that it should, you know, things like that, that sort of, you know, made a lot of people angry, mm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a, I remember there was a question there on that subject mm. that said, do you think, still think that Russell Square should be made an official <laughs> cruising ground? Which is actually just up the road from here. I mean, sort of Absolutely. Um, <laughs> well, no, I don't. I, we never ever did anything just for the sake of publicity or headlines. I mean, that's just not the, that's not our political or our moral framework. We say things because we believe them. Um, we say things that we know sometimes will be provocative and confrontational. Well, hang on, so, hang which, on a which, minute. You don't you don't invade the uh, cathedral in Canterbury. Um, and not want to grab a headline. I mean, you, you could make an appointment to go and see the Archbishop of Canterbury if you wanted to discuss something. No, he you? refused to meet us. He yeah. repeatedly refused to meet us and repeatedly refused to meet the lesbian and gay Christian movement or any other gay Christians. So after eight years having the door slammed in our face, that's why we went to Canterbury Cathedral. But you knew that would get a headline. We, we, we want, our objective was not to get the headlines for us, but to get the headlines to shame and embarrass the Archbishop to expose the fact but on many of the key uh, gay, right, gay human rights issues, the then Archbishop, Dr George Kerry, 
was openly advocating discrimination, that he was saying gay and lesbian people should not be equal before the law, that it's right for the law to discriminate. And until we did that, very few people knew that he was saying that and that he was actually mobilising bishops in the House of Lords. He was orchestrating them to vote against gay equality. What, what do you say to those gay people who say that you get all gay people a bad name by uh, indulging in these stunts, whereas I mean, 90% of gay people just want to live a quiet life and don't want to be associated with the sort of what they would term extreme activities that you get involved in? Well, I think every movement for social justice has at some point had to rattle the cages of the establishment, to do provocative things, challenging mm. things, things that they've often been criticised for. I can remember as a young boy reading um, black people in the deep south of the United States denouncing Martin Luther King as a troublemaker. Mm. He's coming down here, stirring up trouble, we have to live with the consequences. He's, you know, all, this, all these freedom marches, all this tear gassing, all this stuff, you know, it's giving black people a bad name. And, you know, the same with the suffragettes, you know. Some of the fiercest critics of the suffragettes were other women who said that these extreme tactics mm. are, are damaging the public image and perception of women and undermining the fight for the franchise. Well, I say to them, the suffragists, you know, the mainstream orthodox lobbyists, were important, they had a role, but frankly, until the suffragettes came along, they were making very little headway. It's the suffragettes that really put women's votes on the public agenda. And I think with some modesty and due humility, I think the outrage tactics were highly effective in drawing public attention to some really gross injustices that, you know, writing letters to MPs or delegations to Parliament simply had not succeeded in achieving. Do you think the battle has largely been won now? I mean, is there a need for that kind of stunt, for want of a better word, uh, for further gay rights legislation, I mean, there are civil partnerships now. Although you did say earlier, you used the phrase, you said, well, um, gay marriage is not allowed. I mean, isn't civil partnerships enough? No. I mean, Why not? In a democratic society, we should all be equal, for, equal before the law. And if there's going to be recognition of same-sex relationships, it should be recognition in the form of same-sex marriage. But civil partnership is effectively that. Surely the, the, the marriage side of it has a religious connotation. No, so you can have a civil marriage in a registry office. Why can't gay mm. people have a civil marriage in a registry office? You know, there's, no, there's no reason, apart from prejudice. Well, you can have a civil partnership in a registry office. Yeah, but it's, that's a bit like saying to black people, I'm sorry, you can't get married. You know, black, black people are banned from marriage. That, that's, 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 the, that's the effect of it. But, but what would a gay marriage do that a civil partnership doesn't? Well, it's, it's symbolically very important. Let, let's just do, do give another analogy. Let's say the government said to the Jewish community, I'm sorry, you're Jews. Marriage is only for Gentiles. I'm sorry, Jews cannot get married. But we'll give you a separate system, which is really marriage in all but name for Jewish people. The Jewish community would not accept it. They would say this is anti-Semitic. Most non-Jews would say it's anti-Semitic. We would say this is the kind of discriminatory law that we would expect to find in a Nazi regime, not in a modern, civilised, democratic nation. But isn't marriage primarily a religious institution? No, it's now. It's, we have civil marriage. Most people get married in civil marriage ceremonies, I think. Um, and I, I, I believe that, you know, the homophobia of the ban on same-sex marriage is wrong. Equally, I believe the heterophobia of the ban on, on opposite-sex civil partnerships is wrong. Two wrongs don't make a right. You know, you've you got this anomaly where gay people can't get married and heterosexual couples can't uh, have civil partnerships. You know, these, these well, are, they these get are married. Two, these are two well, so what's the problem? If, if two, in, if in name only, though, really, I suppose, if, it's a, if you're going to a registry office and you're having a civil partnership or a civil marriage, it's kind of in name, name only in what they've, they've called it. Well, in that case, why didn't we all agree so, with apartheid? Apartheid was supposedly separate but equal. No, what I'm saying is what, what you're asking for, really, is just that the two things are called the same the same thing. If somebody's going to ha get, have a civil marriage in a, in a registry office, they could say, okay, well, now on, if you're going there, it's not going to be called a marriage, it's going to be called a civil partnership. And as long as everyone is, is, is calling it the same thing, it, it would be equal. No, I just think it's, it's wrong in principle to reinforce and extend discrimination, not just perpetuate, but extend discrimination by creating a new exclusive category of law for one section of the community. You know, to separate one section of the community and say, you can't have what everybody else can have, but we'll give you this, it's separate, it's for you. That is not equality, it's not democracy. But I mean, marriage has always been between men and women. 
So what, why, why, why would you necessarily want the same term to be used? Well, because, you know, if we're going to validate relationships, and if some lesbian and gay people, perhaps not a majority, but if some want to have fair and equal treatment on a par with their heterosexual friends and families, why shouldn't they? Very quick uh, questions, because I know we're, we're running out of time. So very short. We've got uh, <laughs> Voyager said, uh, do you think that Australia might have a better quality of life and that sensible people would return there? <laughs> That's a polite way of putting uh, it. Uh, anyway. to, Not to under John that. Howard, the current <laughs> Prime Minister. He's a great man. I think we've got, got time to get oh, into no, that go now. On, let's we, that one. Um, David Lindsay says, do you still believe in lowering the age of consent to 14? Or 9, as apparently um, was advocated in a letter to The Guardian 10 years ago. I never advocated an age of consent of 9. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I do think that it's wrong to criminalise young people where they're both of similar ages and under the age of consent, that's a stupid, you know, stupid way of but approaching do you, it. Uh, but, I mean, do they anyway, though? I mean, it happens all the time, and you don't see people getting locked up and put away from Well, it, really. about, I can't remember what the most recent figures are, but a few years back, around about 800 young, mostly heterosexual men were being cautioned or getting convictions for consenting sex with partners um, who were just a few, one or two or a few years difference in age. I think, you know, that we need to protect young people against abuse. But the way to do that is earlier, better quality sex education, to encourage people to make wise, responsible choices, to give people the confidence, the skills, to say no. Because that's, that's, that's what most, you know, you know, sex abuse is about. It isn't coercive, it isn't violent. It's about people being manipulated and pressured. And I'm amazed that in a society which is very conscious about child sex abuse, and rightly so, that we don't teach in schools assertiveness training so that young people feel confident, in many cases, uh, to say no to unwanted sex. But, it, but if you re reduce the age of consent to 14, isn't that sending out a message that, that sex is fine at the age of 14? And, it, and indeed, if you reduce it by two years, I mean, we're, we're, I think the law is fairly tolerant of, of uh, people who are maybe 14, 15, who have sex with others who are of roughly the same age. If you take it down to 14, you could argue that you're almost licensing it at 12. Because at the moment, you're, you're effectively tolerating it at 14 mm. with an age of 16. We'll put it this way. I mean, Canada and I think 12 or so other European countries have an age of consent of 14. Yeah. Uh, for Spain, both gay, for both is gay 13, isn't it? Uh, well, Spain and Portugal and, and Malta in certain circumstances, mm. even as low as 12. But you know, there are qualifications. Um, but in none of these countries has there been any perceptible increase in uh, child sex abuse. Mm -hmm. um, in the Netherlands, until recently, they had an age of consent of 12, providing both partners consented and providing the parents and social welfare authorities didn't complain. Yeah. And now, what's interesting is that that went hand in hand with earlier, better quality sex education. And as a result, in the Netherlands, their rate of teenage pregnancies was seven times less than in Britain. Their rate of teenage abortions was 11 times less. So I think the Dutch are onto something. You know, empowering young people with rights and responsibilities, with skills and confidence to negotiate the sex they want safely and with consent, and to resist the sex they don't want and to report abusers, that's the key. Because you can raise the age of consent to 25. It isn't going to stop abusers because they ignore the law. Well, well we'd love to come back to you on that, but I'm afraid we have run out yeah. of time this evening. Our but uh, I think we have to have you back another day because there's so much we, can, <laughs> we could talk about. Um, but that is all we've got time for. Thank, thank you very much to Peter Tatchell for coming in. And we will be coming up shortly with uh, Box Politics. <laughs>